Hi there. Today I wanted to share with you a project that has kept me busy throughout the Christmas holidays. I have been migrating all of my websites, which were previously scattered across several servers, both AWS and uh, GCP, and I brought them into a single cluster using Google Kubernetes Engine. My criteria for this project was to reduce costs as much as possible. I wanted to automate absolutely everything. And I also wanted it to serve as a training ground for me to experiment with uh, uh, new technologies and new best practices that I've learned. For example, like GitOps, uh, Terraform, Argo CD, Helm templates, and so on. And uh, I also wanted to uh, try some cost-saving options that you have available in a Google Kubernetes engine, which are the preemptible VMs, which have been there for a while. And now there's a new option, which is called the Spot VMs. Also, one of my biggest criteria was to try and save costs as much as possible, since all of this is actually coming out of my own pocket and I don't want to waste money on the cloud. Also, I made sure I automated every single step of my setup in case I ever need to move quickly from one cloud provider to the other, or maybe I need to recreate my environment for whatever reason, I don't know. Without further ado, let's get started. I'm a big fan of GitHub and GitLab. Both are very capable uh, cloud providers of Git repositories and are crucial building blocks for any GitOps approach. I ended up choosing GitLab because it offers so much more for free. Git repositories with up to 10 gigabytes of storage per repository, 400 free CI CD minutes per month, integration with Terraform to store state files, free private container registries, and so much more. One of my key cost-saving measures was to store all my database backups and media in a Git repository using LFS. LFS stands for Large File Storage, and basically this is the protocol added on top of Git to mitigate some of the issues it has handling uh, versioning of binary files. Storing backups in Git are not something I would ever recommend to a client, but in my case, my backups are small, I'm only dealing with uh, small websites with tiny databases. And this is just for me, for personal use and experimentation. Git stores files forever, so eventually I'll have to cleanse my repository from all the backup files stored over time in the server. Now let's uh, briefly discuss the Git repository structure I decided to go with. I followed the multi-repo approach, which means I have multiple Git repositories instead of just one. I created a single GitLab group with the following uh, Git repositories. The Terraform infrastructure project hosts all the Terraform code and state that creates all the cloud infrastructure needed from the GKE cluster and even the GitLab variables needed for the CI CD to work. The cluster management project holds all the shared Kubernetes services, which are installed after the Kubernetes cluster is created. For instance, NGINX Ingress, Argo CD, Cert Manager, Prometheus, and so on. Helm file is used to install and update uh, the Helm templates. Helm file runs on top of Helm and co helps combining multiple charts and keeping environment configuration separate from the charts. Another approach I could have taken, and probably is a better solution, is to install an Argo CD bootstrap via Terraform and then allow Argo CD to install all the Kubernetes shared services. The Kubernetes templates project holds YAML configuration for Argo CD, and for each uh, website framework, we store here a Helm chart. For each website, we then store a separate uh, values.yaml file. Argo CD monitors the, uh, the, this Git repository, and whenever it sees any template update or a version change, it deploys the change automatically to the Kubernetes cluster. Each website has its own Git repository with the Git LFS enabled. This means I can store any large binary files in Git without worrying too much about the repository size getting out of hand. Each time I change this repository, I create a tag with a version number using semantic versioning. If you don't know semantic versioning, uh, semantic versioning is a very simple system for versioning an application with three numbers separated by dots. The first number is the major release version, and it's normally incremented when there are significant changes to the application, major releases. 
uh, then you have the second number, which is the minor release version. And these are, uh, this is typically used for minor updates to the application. And then you have the patch number for any bug fixes or security updates. The GitLab CI CD, then whenever we change this repository, it builds and pushes a Docker image to the GitLab container registry. And this image will then be ready to be deployed to Kubernetes. My Terraform setup only needs an empty GCP project and an existing uh, GCP service account with the required permissions. My Terraform plan, first of all, enables all the required GCP APIs. It creates a VPC network, the cloud buckets, the GKE cluster with the required node pools, and the GitLab integration with the new cluster is also configured. This integration is needed by the cluster management project to deploy shared Kubernetes service to the cluster. Finally, all the required secrets are created and workload identity is set up for any pod that requires access to GCP services. The Terraform code runs via GitLab CI CD and the Terraform state is stored using GitLab's Terraform integration. I now need to address an important uh, point about uh, the GitLab integration with Kubernetes. The preferred uh, GitLab integration with Kubernetes is changing. GitLab is moving from a push-based deployment to Kubernetes to a pull-based deployment, which is the GitOps way. For that reason, GitLab has deprecated the existing Kubernetes integration using cluster certificates. I was willing to use the new GitLab uh, Kubernetes agent, but after some investigation, I couldn't find enough documentation for simple use cases. No mention is made about support for Helm or Customize, and since these are fundamental blocks of any modern Kubernetes application, the only possible assumption I can make is that the Kubernetes agent is not ready yet. So I've decided to use a phased approach, which is for now to use the deprecated uh, Kubernetes integration for installing cluster-wide applications, in this case via the cluster management project, and Argo CD, I will use it for pool-based deployments as much as possible so that I'm ready to completely switch to GitLab once the Kubernetes agent is fully featured. Well, let's talk about the database now. To save money, and because I think uh, my databases are quite light, I decided that I didn't need to use the managed database service from Google, Cloud SQL. But who wants to manage their own database and be responsible for backups? So I had to come up with an elegant solution for that. I decided to host a MySQL database in Kubernetes and use Kubernetes cron jobs to backup the database. Hosting a database in Kubernetes is highly controversial as it is better suited for stateless containers. And a database is everything but stateless. What could go wrong? Uh, before uh, creating my own solution, I looked into the different MySQL operators available. This is a minefield. Plenty of Kubernetes MySQL operators are no longer maintained and actively discouraged to be used in production. I ended up shortlisting a Percona MySQL operator. I tried this operator and it worked well, but I quickly realized that it is uh, far too complex and uh, demands more computing resources and memory than what I'm willing to pay for. It requires, uh, as a minimum, to run three separate instances of MySQL in a cluster configuration. I have, I have prior experience of running MySQL in a cluster configuration, and all I can say is that running your own MySQL database in cluster mode is the equivalent of owning a white elephant. So I had to come up with my own simple solution. What I did was to create a simple Helm chart for MySQL to run as a single container with a persistent volume and the, then a, a Helm chart to create and backup databases for each website that needs it. The beauty of it is that each time I need to add a new website and it needs a database, all I need to create is a values.yaml file, which contains the name of the database, username, reference to any secrets for the credentials, and then the Git repository to store the backups. Then I also can mention the, the frequency of the backups, and you're good to go. Okay, let's now talk about load balancing and uh, ingress controller. Load balancing, of, obviously, is a crucial requirement for any application hosted in Kubernetes. Google Kubernetes Engine offers you an out-of-the-box ingress controller. 
the ingress control is very easy to use. However, for each ingress uh, you create using the default ingress controller, a separate forwarding rule is added for load balancing. And this costs more money. Okay, you get the first five forwarding rules for under $20 a month. That doesn't sound too much. But after that, for each forwarding rule, you need to pay $8 per month. So for each website you're hosting that requires external access and an SSL certificate, you need to create a separate ingress which will require an additional forwarding rule, which costs more money. So for my project to save uh, money, and also because uh, I need additional features not available in the uh, default ingress controller, I decided to go with open source Kubernetes NGINX ingress controller. You might be confused because there is two different ingress controllers called NGINX ingress. But I'm talking about the Kubernetes one. So the Kubernetes NGINX ingress controller is by far the most popular ingress controller uh, for Kubernetes. Out of the box, when you install it in uh, Kubernetes, the NGINX ingress controller provisions a load balancer with a single forwarding rule and a single public IP address, and all the ingresses share the same external IP address. For me, that's a feature. Some might not uh, agree with that because they want separate IP addresses. You can still have multiple IP addresses, but it's a bit more complicated. But anyway, most likely you don't need it because if you're only worried about SEO and privacy, you should be hiding your IP in Cloudflare or some other um, DDoS uh, protection uh, service. The best thing about the uh, Kubernetes NGINX ingress controller is that it gives you the power of NGINX without having to run a separate pod for it. Many of the optimizations that you can use in the NGINX, such as the configuration options, the caching rules, the rewrite rules, and so on, they are also available directly from the ingress controller if you know how to use it. I love it. I hope you do as well. Okay, now we are getting to the really juicy part of my migration project. I decided to make use of preemptible node pools. GKE, if, you, if you're not aware of, has the ability of creating node pools with preemptible VMs. These VMs cost less and they are up to 90% uh, cheaper than the standard price of a full price node. There are just two major drawbacks. A preemptible node can shut down automatically at any point in time with almost no notice and you can't use the same VM for more than 24 hours. It will also shut down automatically. GKE will automatically attempt to provision a new preemptible VM for you, but you have to bear this in mind. There might not be enough preemptible VMs available in your zone. So your preemptible uh, node pool might end up running dry. Okay, so recently uh, GCP has also added the ability of GKE creating node pools with spot VMs. And what are spot VMs? Spot VMs have all the advantages in terms of pricing as preemptible VMs, but without the limitation of having to shut down every 24 hours. So in theory, you could be making use of a spot VM for weeks at 90% discount without a single shutdown. I'll be switching to spot VMs as soon as the Terraform Google provider fully supports it. Right now, it's still in a beta stage. Because I decided to incorporate uh, preemptible nodes in my design, it was really important that whenever a worker node shut down, all the essential services continued running without downtime. All the pods should be able to restart automatically without error, and more importantly, without any data loss. I, for that reason, created two node pools. The core node pool, uh, which uses the standard GKE nodes, which should not experience sudden shutdowns, except for upgrades and maybe for unforeseen events that can happen, things outside our control, but this should be very rare. The second node pool I created was for me to be able to, to use preemptible or spot nodes that can experience shutdowns, but because they'll be much cheaper, I will try to make as much use as possible of these VMs. With affinity rules, I made sure that essential services that can't be replicated, for instance, the database, should only run on the core node pool. The database is core, and unfortunately, I can't have more than one replica. So I need to make sure that this single replica I have is running in 
in a, a node 24 seven if possible. But I've already tested this for experimentation. I forced the database pod to run in the ephemeral node pool and it was able to recover quite quickly once the node shut down and it moved uh, to the other node pool I had, which is the standard node pool. So at least that testing is done. On the other hand, services which I really don't mind being unavailable for a couple of minutes or maybe a half an hour, depends. For example, Argo CD. I only use Argo CD whenever I'm updating uh, the website and I'm not doing that 24 seven. I only do it on some of my spare time. Uh, then I use affinity rules so that these uh, pods, these services, uh, Argo CD can be quite heavy because he also uses uh, Redis. Uh, they only run on the ephemeral node pool which means they'll be shutting down and, uh, you know, so what? It doesn't matter. You are probably waiting for more details on how I'm going to monitor all of this. Even uh, with the best Kubernetes setup in, uh, in the world, uh, chances are that at some point, some pod will fail to restart and maybe some backup is going to fail and who knows what else. It's, it's really important that you know about something when it fails. So that made me already set up Prometheus. I've already integrated that with uh, uh, GitLab as the minimum step. This already gives me information about the health of my cluster, but I need more, of course. Uh, I need to have a better monitoring and alert solution, and I have to add Alert Manager and Grafana. Prometheus is for metrics, Grafana is for visualization, and Alert Manager is for sending alerts. And then you should also add, I should also add full and D for collecting logs.